Thank you for joining us for the Antimicrobial Resistance Webinar. My name is Shannon Sabera. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for USDA APHIS Animal Care, and I will serve as your facilitator for today's webinar. Today's presenters are Dr. Kathy Campitelli. She's the Kennel and Small Pet Field Specialist for USDA APHIS Animal Care, and Dr. Shively. She's the Epidemiologist Antimicrobial Resistance Coordinator for USDA APHIS Veterinarian Services. This webinar is being recorded and it will be placed on the Animal Care Attending Veterinarian website after completion. Our website is currently being revised. So please be patient as we do not have a timeline that the presentation will be posted or available. If you have any general questions during the presentation, please submit them via the Q&A box and our panel will answer them at the end of the webinar as time permits. I will now turn it over to Dr. Martha Camp Keller, Center for Animal Welfare Director for USDA APHIS Animal Care for opening remarks. Martha. Thanks, Shannon. And thank you everyone for taking the time to attend our webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, as many of you know, antimicrobial resistance is a global One Health phenomenon. And it affects people, it affects animals, and our environment. Um, here in animal care, um, our primary focus is on the welfare of animals, but health and welfare, as you all know, are very closely related. So many of the recommendations um, in the webinar that you'll hear are actually already part of our animal welfare regulations. Um, but we're bringing them to you because these actions have an impact on welfare, but they also help reduce the chances of antimicrobial resistance developing in our animal populations. Um, you know, animal care was approached a little over a year ago by the AVMA. Um, they had concerns about multi-drug resistant infections in people that were being traced back to contact with animals at some of our regulated facilities. Um, they reached out to us because fortunately we are well positioned to reach out to you, um, our attending veterinarians who work with these populations, um, and we wanted to talk with you about ways to address the issues. Um, we've also collaborated with uh, our partner program, Veterinary Services. You'll hear from Dr. Shively a little bit later, um, who serves as the lead for APHIS on the Federal Antimicrobial Resistance Working Group. Um, and she helped provide us uh, with the most current updates and recommendations to bring to you. You know, animal care here, we really, really respect um, the work that attending veterinarians do at our regulated facilities. We trust you with the primary oversight of the health and welfare for those animals. Um, we do wanna make it clear that we're not changing or adding any new regulations to how we evaluate attending veterinarians or the veterinary care that um, you provide through the Animal Welfare Act. Um, the webinar is simply meant to raise awareness um, and to help direct you to resources that are available to you um, so you can practice medicine in the best way possible, um, not only for the health and welfare of the animals, um, but also for the people involved in the environment. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Capitelli to get us uh, kicked off on the presentation. Dr. Capitelli. Thanks, Martha. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us on this evening. I know that you have a lot of options and it's a busy time of year for how you could be spending tonight, but we're glad that you're here with us tonight. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. The objectives for tonight's presentation, I want you to be able to walk away from here being able to define antimicrobial resistance, and you'll see me and hear me abbreviate this AMR. You might see it in other places as simply AR. You'll be able to identify risk factors that contribute to developing AMR among our animal populations and determine what you can do about it within the confines of your roles and authorities as attending veterinarians. Finally, I hope you'll be able to learn about the ongoing efforts among the greater uh, governmental agencies, as well as external to the government, and then some resources that you can turn to if you want to learn more and better direct your efforts in your medical practices. 
this is by no means a comprehensive lecture on how antimicrobial resistance develops. This is simply, as Martha pointed out, a way to raise your awareness and direct you to um, the areas within that authority and within your responsibilities where you can maybe perhaps make some changes and, uh, and help contribute to this effort. Before we move to the next slide and start with our definition section, I do just wanna draw everybody's attention to the picture. We have here a culture and sensitivity plate. You can see the gold bacterial growth growing there and those five white discs each have a different antibiotic um, impregnated in there so that it's in contact with that bacteria. The upper left and the middle right, you can see that there's that clear zone where the bacteria has been inhibited. So it is thus sensitive or susceptible to those two drugs. The other three, you can see there's no area of clear zone. There's no bacterial inhibition. So it is resistant to each of those three drugs. Just to give you a picture of that before we start talking about how it develops. Next slide, please. So what is this? How does this occur? Microorganisms like bacteria and fungi encode survival mechanisms within their DNA. And they have lots of different tools in their toolbox. They can avoid detection as we know from the immune system itself. They can prevent binding by different cells or compounds. They can identify the antibiotics that they're trying to avoid and be able to extrude those uh, proteins that are binding with them for after they've entered the cell. So they have a lot of different ways that they can achieve this resistance. They also trade and spread genes as they multiply. And the more likely you have presence of antimicrobials within a patient, within a bacterial population, the more likely they are going to trade and spread those resistance genes. It creates a selection pressure. It kills off the bacteria that are susceptible, and then it allows the bacteria that are resistant to proliferate further and have more chances of trading those resistance genes, proliferating that resistance pattern, and also thus able to spread to both humans and animals. And let's recognize that this is also able, able to happen both in a, uh, a, a normal healthy patient, because we all have commensal bacteria in our skin or GI tract, as well as in a sick patient with an established bacterial infection. So there is a lot of opportunity for this to occur and you know, spread again to the humans, the animals, and in the environment, as we'll see here in a few minutes. Next slide. This is just a video to show how this develops over time. Let's have a look. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands. And at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, of course, thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. Then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that Bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So 
So I hope this helped you appreciate the many possibilities that develop when there is that selection pressure to favor what he called the mutant strains that become resistant and spread those genes as they continue to persist in the presence of that drug. So there's not just one single resistance gene that it switches on and it's now resistant. There are many, many ways that this can occur over time. This slide is actually uh, an infographic from the CDC and it depicts how microbes can trade and spread those genetic material pieces. We've got the small green plasmids, the circular plasmids, which are frequently traded easily between neighbors. And you can also see the, the purple strands that those small SNPs can be easily extracted and, and replicated and traded in, in an easy fashion. Once you remove that selection pressure, however, those genes will sometimes get offloaded. So it's not that once it becomes resistant and it continues to grow, it's going to continue being resistant forever. Those are, there's a lot of cellular mechanics and energy that goes into replicating all of those pieces of DNA. It's sort of like when your phone is at capacity. You never, you ever tried to open an app that you haven't used in a while. If your phone's close to storage, you have to re-download it because your phone is offloading that because it's no longer needed. So the same type of thing can happen with these resistance genes. So, and, and it, once again, when that selection pressure is applied again, another antibiotic comes into that environment, um, the, it creates an opportunity for any number of new ways to evolve uh, through that mutation process, as you saw in the video. Next slide. Why is this important? This is primarily because there's no drugs, there's no um, cure for the infections that we are sick with. So this is a CDC report. It's published about every five or six years. And this is mainly coming from human data. And so obviously it's a big concern. We have people who are sick. There's nothing that we can reach for to help them get better. This slide has a lot of numbers, but I do want to draw your attention to just a few if I can highlight them. So from 2013, the last edition of this report to 2019, we see an increasing, a slight increasing number of resistant infections, but we see a decreasing number of deaths. And this tells us that this data that's generated mostly from hospital patients, hospitalized patients reporting this to the CDC, that the measures that are in place or that are implemented once a hospital identifies a patient with a resistant infection, those are working to help cure or help the patient survive that infection. What are those things? Well, they put the patient in isolation. They minimize the traffic in and out of, um, in and out of that room and that exposure to that patient. They're taking extra precautions with their disinfection and sanitizing procedures. They are potentially doing a, an increased monitoring and surveillance or they're sampling frequently to check what is going on inside that environment, what's going on inside that patient. So we can take some of those measures and we can apply them in other ways that will help us reduce the spread of these resistant bacteria. The other number that I wanna highlight on this slide is the last bullet there, that this comprehensive report discusses 18 bacteria and fungi of concern that have shown resistance patterns that have been diagnosed in human patients. And we'll compare that with the animal numbers on the next slide. So this report is actually from the AVMA. And again, we have a list of over 20 pathogens of concern that have shown resistance patterns. And the chart actually is the list of those pathogens. Across the top are the different drugs that they've been shown to be resistance, resistant to. And then the colored dots correspond to the species of animals that are most commonly affected by those infections. So again, we have the serious threat to animal health. We've got sick animals that we don't have necessarily the right drugs or the legal drugs to use to help those animals recover, as well as um, this uh, phenomenon where of these over 20 listed here in the animal list, seven are the same as those 18 on the CDC list. So we're dealing with the same drug, same bugs that are resistant to the same drugs. It's, this is a growing concern. And you can understand that it's not just for the animals and the people who are working with them closely, but also their families, their caretakers, their communities, 
and you, the people who are working with them, you know, on a semi-frequent basis, um, it, it's, a, it's a risk to you as well. So we're all concerned about this and we want to focus our efforts on preventing infections in the first place, as well as practicing good antimicrobial stewardship. And you'll hear me define that in a minute um, for once we've identified a sick animal. Next slide. So again, we see evidence that this is definitely a growing global One Health concern. And it's especially, you know, we have the human impact, we have the animal impact, and now we're actually seeing environmental impact. There's an increasing number of infections that have been reported outside of hospitals, or what we call community acquired. It's not coming from inside a hospital once a patient has already been admitted. So they're getting it from their food, they're getting it from the animals that they contact regularly, they're picking it up somewhere out in the environment. And like I mentioned before, those hospital measures, those isolation and, and disinfection procedures, you can't apply those to the environment. You can't isolate yourself from the world. You can't sanitize the world. So there's much greater exposure when we have those community acquired infections. You're not able to contain it. It's difficult to track the spread and trace it back to one single location because how do you, how, how do you track what everybody came into contact with in a single day or a week? Think about how many surfaces you've touched in the last day, in the last week. Any one of those could have been a, a contaminated with a, a, a resistant bacteria. We just don't know, it's too hard to track. And then ultimately what we have is a threat to those of us in the community who are the most vulnerable, are immunocompromised, are elderly, are um, chronic illness patients. All of those have that greater impact on the community. And as Martha alluded to at the beginning, We've been hearing reports of this from other agencies, other animal-focused uh, organizations. Um, so I I pulled a couple of the headlines as I was reviewing and, and researching for this presentation. Uh, the first one on the right there from the FDA, uh, raw pet food. So dogs and cats actually have been found, depending on the report, to be 11 to over 100 times more likely to shed an antibiotic resistant bacteria compared to animals who are fed traditional diets. So once again, we have those animals shedding in their, fe in their feces. It's seeding into the environment. How many of you actually sanitize the sidewalk after your dog poops on a walk? You know, it's out there in the environment and then it's still capable to cause infections in humans, in, in pet animals, in wildlife animals. Um, so again, it's that's, uh, a continuing concern. The other headline is discussing this ongoing investigation. I think actually it's concluded now, but um, they identified over 168 cases of Campylobacter across 18 states over nearly 10 years, going back through and, and checking uh, genetic data for other patients. 97% of the people they interviewed reported contact with a dog or a puppy within one week and 88% of those contacts were with a pet store. Luckily, there was not a link to a single source or a, whether that's a breeder or a broker or a single pet store or even a chain of pet stores. So again, it, drawed, it drew attention to the um, antibiotic usage and other practices at breeders and the need for improved prevention strategies and stewardship in these dog breeding settings. I just wanna emphasize again that there's many domestic and international organizations and you'll hear Chelsea talk a little bit more at the towards the end of the presentation about that. So everybody is pledging to do their part and to work together to combat this phenomenon and its impacts. APHIS and USDA is just one and that is what really we're here for tonight. Next slide. The idea of antimicrobial stewardship is the last definition that I'll, I'll say for you. This is a set of standards and guidance on proper use, and it is meant to reduce the likelihood of, in, of having that selection pressure that will cause that resistance to, um, to start developing and mutating. These are things like preventing unnecessary or inappropriate use, using diagnostics to identify conditions before you just throw an antibiotic at it. Rule out, make sure that it's not a viral infection before you choose that, uh, that prescription. And it's also got to do with monitoring the culture and sensitivity. 
So uh, are you choosing the correct antibiotic for that infection? Consider alternative therapies to antibiotics. There's a lot of different steps and ideas that will help contribute to uh, good stewardship of, of these drugs. It's also a, a whole practice mentality. And again, you'll hear me talk about that in a few slides. Um, the other principle is to require your veterinarian's oversight. And you know, there's a lot of these things already that are built in from the FDA. So we have the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act or colloquially known as AMDUCA. We should be familiar with that already. And that mandates stewardship of drugs in food producing animals. We're already familiar with the Veterinary Feed Directive, which limits the use of antibiotics as food additives for prevention or growth promotion purposes um, to those which are authorized and prescribed by a veterinarian. There is a third uh, guidance for industry or GFI number 263. I don't know if any of you heard about that that came out this year back in June. Uh, I just read a report that the FDA has declared that this was a successful voluntary campaign for all antibiotics of medical importance that remain that had remained available over the counter to incorporate language on their labels to say um, something to the effect of prescription only, use as directed by a veterinarian, something to that effect. And so again, we've got this kind of mandated veterinary oversight. So giving you a little bit more authority so that you have a, a direct familiarity with how those animals are getting those antibiotics. The last principle of stewardship it emphasizes husbandry and prevention. So again, re it, reducing the total number of infections that appear in a population will require the need for less drugs and will less likely to have that selection pressure. We'll review some different resources that provide guidance on antimicrobial stewardship at the end, as well as if you are, are patient, as Shannon said, and, and download the PDF when it is available and, and post it on our website. Uh, the PDF should have all these links that are clickable for you. So we encourage you to do that and explore those options and those resources um, that have been compiled by experts in, of any different specialty. Um, choose your, choose your, your specialty of choice. They have, a, they have a set of these and I hope that you're able to explore those. Next slide. We've finished our definition section. Now we're going to look for some red flags to watch out for that might be contributing to AMR development in animal facilities. Next. The first the, and biggest risk factor is any expired or contaminated antibi antibiotics because those are no longer going to be as effective. They're not proven. And so we just don't wanna run that risk. We don't wanna have them creating any of that selection pressure if they're a sub substandard um, treatment uh, efficacy anymore. So the first thing about that is to make sure that the expectations you have on how facilities handle and dispose of expired or contaminated drugs are very plain. Make sure they understand that what they are to do with those. I listed also a blanket prescription. And what I mean by this is I've seen on shelves in kennels, uh, a prescription bottle that says four kennel dogs use as directed. Well, what does that mean? How do you know that the facility knows what that means? How, do you, how confident are you that they're using it appropriately? If you're not that confident, I would recommend giving them explicit instructions somehow in their written program of veterinary care, which again, you'll hear me talk about in a few minutes, uh, written on your go-home instructions if they're bringing the animal into you to see you at your clinic, or on those prescription labels. Again, that FDA rule comes in handy and you can use that as an excuse or, or, or a crutch to say, you know, we really need to have veterinary oversight. It needs to be a prescription. It's not available over the counter anymore. It needs to be coming through the veterinary office. And, and it helps you provide those good instructions and, and make sure that it's the, the right dose, the right duration for every in, in, infection. Written plans that contain routine or pre routine prevention or group treatments with antibiotics. In some cases, group preventive antibiotics are necessary. 
Like if you have a litter of puppies and if you have a respiratory infection, you're probably just gonna treat all the puppies. That makes sense. However, I've heard many breeders routinely giving antibiotics after whelping to prevent pyometra and at weaning to prevent mastitis. And this usually comes from, you know, I had one female that went through this, I had to give her antibiotics and she did great. So now I just give it to everyone. Well, that's not really good stewardship. Unless they have this proven track record of having these difficulties, it's probably not the best practice. So you, there's room for you to give maybe specific conditions under which the licensee should be giving those antibiotics. Like if there's a discolored discharge after a few days postpartum, if she comes down with a fever or her mammary glands are hot or she's in apparent discomfort, there's, a, there's making sure that you can, that the licensee rather is um, choosing when to use those antibiotics in the appropriate conditions. You can also look for other ways to prevent infections, including vaccines if they're available, any anti-inflammatory or other supportive care to help reduce inappropriate antibiotic use. Another red flag is poor infection control strategies. If the environment or the animals are con constantly dirty, of course there's gonna be a risk for a greater amount of bacterial infections. Um, take a look at the disinfection procedures. If they're not following the labels properly, they're not using PPE, or they don't have an isolation or quarantine facility, and if they're not following any sort of preventive care plan. The last red flag here is the health or environmental stressors. Think about underlying conditions like parasites. If they have environmental issues like overcrowding, temperature and humidity extremes, poor ventilation, we all know that chronic stress from these other things can lead to immune system suppression and allow more infections to take hold in an animal population. Next slide. We recognize that some risk factors are difficult or almost impossible to eliminate. We do have immune suppression because we've got pregnant or neonatal animals. We do have those patients with uh, immunosuppressive uh, diagnoses, cancer, uh, hormonal imbalances, chronic steroids. So when you have those risk factors, you do want to try to take uh, extra precautions and manage that risk so that you minimize that uh, selection pressure and that uh, risk of AMR development. So this table just kind of outlines some of those things. Um, some we've already mentioned, biosecurity and quarantine, um, starting with, you know, good welfare from the beginning, as Martha alluded to, um, you know, a lot of these recommendations are built into our regulations temperature. It's, it's part of our regs. Uh, so it's not only important for the immediate comfort, but also for, you know, keeping that patient, that animal in a, um, in a better immune state uh, by reducing its stress. Um, Antimicrobial stewardship, again, using the proper, following those principles and, uh, and applying those techniques. You know, not every single infection I, I'm asking you to, to do a culture and sensitivity test on, but maybe if you get a rash of infections all at one time, maybe you do send one out, one sample out for testing to make sure that you're picking the right drug for that um, and avoiding those antibiotics as routine prevention, as I already mentioned. Uh, the last the, the last point about raw food diets, I already mentioned the, the shedding uh, once the diet has been ingested, but actually before it even goes in, there's a proven uh, risk of about a 25% contamination rate, one in four food samples that were, that were part of a, a certain study. So if that facility is feeding raw food, then they need to be making sure they're following the proper precautions to prevent that risk from spreading or, or impacting the facility. Are they storing it appropriately? Are they using good hygiene, washing hands when they're done handling the food? Are they sanitizing their, their prep and, and tools properly? Each of those things can help those uh, mitigate those risks. Next slide. Okay, now we've talked a little bit about um, what it is and how to identify it. And now we're gonna learn where you can insert your authority a little bit more and determine what you can do to help mitigate this risk. 
Uh, first, we're gonna step back and look at the definitions, authorities, and responsibilities that already exist within the Animal Welfare Act. And I do wanna emphasize again, as, uh, as we're going to the next slide, that we are not introducing any new regulation. We're not introducing any new type of procedure or uh, inspection protocol or anything. We're just operating within the confines of what already exists in the Animal Welfare Act. The qualifications that are in the definition of an attending veterinarian are basically summarized in three points. The first component is an educational component, as you can see uh, summarized in the first three bullets here. The second is a training or experience in the species. So if the last time you touched a dog was in your senior year of clinical rotations at vet school, you're probably not qualified to be the attending veterinarian at a puppy breeding facility. The third component is actually sort of a contract between the, the facility and you, that they're granting you the authority uh, to provide the care and oversee the aspects of, of health and welfare at that facility for those animals. And we'll talk about authority more on the next slide. Just wanna draw everybody's attention to the fact that you have more authority at a licensed or registered facility than you do with a typical pet owning client. They must follow your instructions for all aspects of veterinary care and overseeing the, the health as well as their care and use. And this is the responsibility of the licensee or registrant. You are not regulated as the veterinarian. We don't inspect you. We inspect and enforce one, that you've given that guidance where it's required, and two, how well the facility is following your guidance. Part of the inspection process that already exists is to reach out to you, the veterinarian, if the inspector has any questions about the treatment that's going on currently at that facility. And this is not to say that what you've instructed them on or what they're doing is inappropriate, but it's just so that the inspector understands your intentions behind the guidance you gave them and how well the facility is, hearing, is adhering to it. Next slide. On the flip side of the coin, again, the licensee, the registrant are the ones who are being inspected and are responsible. So they have a little bit more of a broad responsibility. They need to hire you under formal arrangements. And that could be a formal employment contract, a full-time employment, or it could be uh, the client uh, relationship that you already have with many other clients in that you're agreeing to be their vet, you're the one that they'll call when they have a question and you'll come out and visit and do a review of their facility and give them the guidance that they need. They're responsible for giving the, their attending veterinarian the authority that we already talked about. They're required to establish and follow programs of adequate veterinary care. And we'll talk about that in a second. But of course, that is also with your consultation. They're not, it's not meant for them to be the driver of that conversation. They're also responsible for performing daily observations of all animals to evaluate the health and well being of those animals and to communicate directly and frequently with you when there are issues that need to be addressed. The last responsibility is for them to provide appropriate facilities and equipment that allows them to provide adequate veterinary care at your direction. Let's look at how a program of veterinary care works. When we say program, we commonly refer to two different things. The first is the written document, which is required for facilities that don't have a full-time vet, as well as for all facilities with dogs. And the regulations have specific requirements as to what must be there for dogs. And I'm not gonna get into great detail about that right now. The second thing, what we mean when we say program is the overall system of how things work to provide care at the facility. And that's really what I'm talking about here because it's the same for everyone. It must, that overall system must address each of these points you see. And I'll tell you a few, ideas about where you can um, advise the facility on uh, providing those methods to combat AMR. So we've got personnel, facilities, and equipment. Well, what is a facility? What's an appropriate facility? Maybe this is an isolation unit or a quarantine section where you're reducing the spread of, of infections from animal to animal. 
methods to prevent and control disease. Well, boy, that's a broad category. Let's, let's think about what all could be included in there. Vaccinations and deworming obviously are, are the first couple of things that come to mind, but controlling disease. This could be a written treatment protocol, and we see a lot of those actually. Daily observations, we already talked about. Guidance to personnel. So what kind of guidance are you giving their employees? What kind of guidance are you giving to the licensee themselves? Um, this could also include things like uh, barrier protections. Are they wearing appropriate PPE? How do they um, take on and, and, and take off that PPE? How are they disinfecting the, the facility? As well as any pre-procedural and post-procedural care. Again, with the understanding that this is in, in line with commonly accepted veterinary standards. So it does, it, it's a broad category and you can use your imagination. You can make this program as superficial or as in-depth as you want it to be, as you think it needs to be for the proper care of the animals at those facilities. Um, I mentioned that I wasn't gonna get into too much detail on the dog requirements. So I put a QR code on this slide. Uh, this takes you to our attending veterinarians webpage where you can find a whole host of resources that help answer some of our most frequently asked questions about what it means to be an attending vet, some tools to help you understand what your responsibilities can be. You can find sample PVC forms, program of veterinary care. So there's a lot of different resources there and there is some information on the dog requirements there as well. This is also where we're gonna post the recording and the, um, the slides when they are available. Moving on. Here we're getting into some of the more specifics on how you can amp up your program to help uh, deal with this AMR issue. So emphasizing the need for uh, vaccinations and prevention, preventing those infections from happening in the first place. And even if there's not a bacterial vaccine available, you know, we heard it over and over again in the height of COVID, make sure you're getting your flu shot because one infection drops your immune system, allows something else to come in behind it and really set in. So keeping up with vaccinations, uh, deworming protocols, like I mentioned already, the underlying stress of parasites that can all be detrimental and suppress those immune systems, allowing infections to take hold. Also the screening tests, you know, some again are required uh, in some areas, but also monitoring those things and checking, catching them early so that they're not uh, impacting those animal populations and, and spreading undetected. The written protocols I've already mentioned a little bit about, but really gauge how comfortable the licensee is on making decisions on when to use and when not to use antibiotics. Maybe consider giving those explicit instructions or request that they call you for anything before they just start throwing antibiotics at everything that's sick, uh, before they consider what else might be going on or helpful in that situation. Again, thinking about that FDA rule, um, you, have, you have a lot of authority that's already given to you from the FDA even on uh, how, the, how and when those antibi antibiotics are prescribed and used. Lastly, the nutrition choices and food. I've already talked about it a little bit already and I don't wanna feel like I'm judging anybody. If, if the recommendation for a facility is to feed a raw diet, that's completely fine. But what I want you to also consider is that the facility must follow those hygiene, storage, disinfection procedures. If they're not doing that and you're not comfortable with them handling that raw diet, you have the authority to provide instructions on what is an appropriate diet. It is all part of that program of veterinary care. It all falls within your authority. So if they're not following your instructions, that is non-compliant with the AWA and it falls on the licensee. Next slide. Some other suggestions that you might consider. Again, we talked a little bit about underlying conditions, the parasites, the body condition, allergies. Um, managing those uh, intrinsic health stressors, again, to reduce the overall stress and, and continue the uh, competent immune system for your patients. And then take extra care with any patients that don't have that full complement. Remember, we're talking about breeding facilities. So pregnant nursing and neonatal animals, they don't have a full a competency of immunity. 
Uh, so there may be extra precautions, even for healthy neonates. Of course, you're, you're recommending wearing gloves during the examinations of, um, uh, of young puppies or you know, other animals that are vulnerable as that. I don't mean to focus so much on dogs, but I am uh, largely the kennel specialist. So that's where the majority of my experience comes from. Uh, implementing any additional infection control protocols, again, totally within your authority. You have the decision to make um, any improvements or changes that are needed. And then emphasize the communication with you, especially for those vulnerable patients, whether they're you know, all pregnant females or, or whelping females, or whether it's you know, a specific patient that has that diagnosis that's affecting them chronically. Make sure that the facilities understand that you need to be looped in whenever there's a change in their condition and or if there's a need to, to alter their care in any way, the facility shouldn't be making those decisions unilaterally. Next slide. Emphasizing again, the infection control strategies, also part of the program of veterinary care. So we already talked about the animal and human hygiene. You remember that muddy pit bull sitting in that, not pit bull, bulldog, uh, sitting in that mud pit. You know, we don't want that. We don't want that um, environment being able to uh, contaminate the, those in, um, animals. Quarantine and isolation facilities, you'll hear that again. Um, we have a, an aid coming out. I'll mention that in the resources section. It's a handout, a one pager that talks about how you can set up those facilities and the, um, the procedures that should be followed before an employee enters and as they come out of those facilities. You can also mention personal protective equipment as well as disinfection, adhering to the proper label instructions, following contact time, you know, all of those different things. Again, part of your uh, program of veterinary care, part of your authority, and totally within your, uh, your ability to make that change. Next slide. So expanding the idea of preventive care also within the authority is to just maximize that welfare, like I said, and as, as we already have discussed, tying it back to the welfare standards that already exist. Um, stressors from other husbandry aspects. We talked a little bit about overcrowding and fighting. You can put that into the program of veterinary care to talk about stocking density or adequate space for each animal, um, aggressive or, or uh, fighting animals that need to be separated, reducing competition for resources and considering interspecies compatibility. Each of these things can be incorporated. Other environmental factors like temperature and humidity we have engineering standards for many of our subpart species, but subpart F doesn't have those built in. But you have the authority to take a look at a species and say, the thermoneutral zone for this animal is, is here. We need the facility to keep a temperature uh, of X degrees and, and that is appropriate for this animal's welfare. So again, part of your authority. Nutrition, we've already covered. Um, also considering psychological distress, we have those uh, plans already built for non-human primates and marine mammals, um, but we're also considering the in, in psychological distress and the mental health of those animals, not just the physical health. So you can have that authority too with the enrichment and socialization that goes on at the facility. Next slide. Now we will branch out into not just what's your authority as an attending veterinarian at a licensed or registered facility under the Animal Welfare Act, but some things that you can do for all animals coming through your door. The first step is to make the conscious choice to follow the principles of stewardship. Outline the steps to take and get everybody involved, all the people in your practice, hold them all accountable or hold each other accountable. Ensure that all your practitioners are using antimicrobials judiciously. Again, using those diagnostics, ruling out viral, culture and sensitivity, and determining the three Ds of antimicrobial stewardship using the right drug at the right dose for the right duration. And then considering any alternative therapies, topicals versus systemic, case-based, if you have a respiratory symptoms, you might consider a cough suppressant or those specific treatments that, um, you know, anti-inflammatories, anything that's not an antibiotic. Next slide. 
Some more suggestions for your overall practice and your stewardship. Again, a lot of resources at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna skip through them for now for time's sake. But again, just some ideas, emphasizing prevention and, and talking with people, talking with your clients to make sure that that is part of your um, overall practice culture. Next slide. I've talked a lot about AMR and the authorities and, and changes that you have the ability to make at regulated facilities under the Animal Welfare Act. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Chelsea Shively with Veterinary Services, who can give you a broader understanding of further efforts within the government and among production and wildlife animal populations. Chelsea? Great, thank you. Next slide, please. So Dr. Campitelli gave a great overview of what antimicrobial resistance is and gave you some tools that you can use as uh, veterinarians to use with your uh, practice and day-to-day and -day operations relating to antimicrobial resistance. And hopefully now you believe that antimicrobial resistance really highlights that interconnectivity of animal health, environmental health, and human health. Now I wanna zoom out and look at what we are doing across the federal government on this important issue. And specifically across USDA APHIS, we are engaged in activities to address antimicrobial resistance related to both the animal health and the environmental health sectors. We recognize that antimicrobials are critically important tools for addressing animal health and protecting animal welfare. And APHIS promotes antimicrobial stewardship and the judicious use of antimicrobials with an emphasis on using a science-based approach. Next slide, please. So while there were activities occurring before 2015 across the US government to address antimicrobial resistance, everything really came together starting with an executive order signed in 2014 by President Obama that led to the development of the first national action plan for combating antibiotic resistant bacteria or CARB that was published in 2015 and provided a roadmap for federal agencies to work together to address antimicrobial resistance across the One Health spectrum. That action plan covered years 2015 through 2020. And then in 2020, we came together again and reevaluated uh, the goals that we had articulated and set new milestones, publishing the second national action plan for CARB in 2020, uh, covering 2020 through 2025 activities. And we anticipate that we'll get started in the next year uh, developing what will be the third national action plan. Uh, and at USDA specifically, just last month, we published a new USDA strategy to address antimicrobial resistance, focusing on the activities that we are doing across the US Department of Agriculture, um, because USDA is uniquely positioned to contribute to the body of scientific knowledge on antimicrobial resistance and really focusing on the use of antimicrobials in animals uh, and in agricultural practices more broadly. Now, I do want to point out that we do not have any regulatory authority on the use of antibiotics. FDA uh, regulates the use of antibiotics, uh, but we are engaged to provide uh, monitoring as well as uh, scientific research to better understand this issue. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to address antimicrobial resistance and how it relates to animal health? And I think that really falls into four primary categories. So first we conduct antimicrobial use and stewardship monitoring. And this is primarily done through the National Animal Health Monitoring System or NOMS that conducts nationwide studies of our uh, primarily livestock animal species on a five to 10 year rotating basis. And these studies collect data regarding everything related to animal health and uh, animal health management. And that includes the use of uh, antibiotics. And so we ask questions about what drugs are being used and for what reasons to help get a better understanding of uh, how these products are being used on farm, as well as better identifying the areas that we need to focus for disease prevention. 
We also ask questions about stewardship. So do the producers use a veterinarian? Um, are they keeping records of their antimicrobial use practices on farm? And that gives us a way to evaluate the impact that some of the new FDA policies have had on producer practices on farm. Second, we look at antimicrobial resistance monitoring. And we do this primarily uh, in two different animal populations. So our NOMS studies also often collect biological samples, so typically fecal samples, and they're looking at antimicrobial resistance profiles in what we would consider to be our public health pathogens. So typically some combination of E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and Enterococcus. Um, so that's what we would consider to be our healthy animal population as these animals will likely end up in the human food supply chain. Um, whereas we also have a relatively new program through the National Animal Health Laboratory Network where we are aggregating samples from veterinary diagnostic labs across the country, looking specifically at animal pathogens and looking at resistance profiles over time. And I do wanna point out that that program includes both livestock species. Um, so we do have cattle, uh, swine and poultry, but we also have some companion animal species in that nationwide data set, including horses, cats, and dogs. And so that's looking at our sick animal population where we would expect to see the resistance profiles to be somewhat different than our healthy animals because they're more likely to have been treated with antibiotics. We also conduct education and outreach. Uh, so this is primarily through webinars like this, as well as uh, through the National Veterinary Accreditation Program, where we have two modules that are specifically related to antibiotic use in animals, as well as the veterinary feed directive. And finally, we do a lot of collaboration with industry and university partners. And we recognize that within APHIS, we do not have the regulatory authority, the resources, or the reach to be able to address this issue alone. And so we've been able to have many different public-private partnerships where we've been able to get um, additional data where we can look at trends in antimicrobial use and resistance over time and the potential relationships between those things, as well as finding uh, better ways of sampling for different pathogens. So for example, trying to find um, less invasive methods for detecting uh, resistance in Mannheimia hemolytica, which is one of the primary drivers of bovine respiratory disease, uh, which is one of the main uh, uses of antibiotics in our uh, cattle populations. Next slide, please. So APHIS also plays a role in addressing antimicrobial resistance in the environment. And so first, uh, we have Wildlife Services has a National Wildlife Research Center out in Fort Collins, Colorado, where they have been conducting laboratory experimental infection and field studies to better understand the role of wildlife in antimicrobial resistance. And some recent studies that they have conducted have shown that starlings and raccoons may be playing a role in the movement of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And most recently, they've been looking at feral swine populations in the San Francisco Bay Area, where they're uh, often feeding on landfills and have very close proximity to a large human population, and comparing the resistance profiles that they're seeing to feral swine that are trapped in rural areas in Texas. Um, secondly, our plant protection and quarantine group addresses antimicrobial resistance in crops through cooperative projects. And so one example of this is working with Michigan State University to address fire blight uh, in apples and pears and looking at antibiotics as well as alternatives for addressing that uh, plant disease. Next slide, please. So I do want to note the importance of staying engaged in the global dialogue regarding antimicrobial use and resistance. I know that might be, not be something that you all think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but the topic of antimicrobial resistance only seems to be heating up globally. There are commitments being made by the G7, by the G20, and huge investments by the quadripartite, which includes the World Organization for Animal Health. And importantly, the UN General Assembly meeting in September of 2024 will, will include a high level meeting on antimicrobial resistance, which will be the first time this topic has been 
uh, featured at the UN since 2016. And we've already seen a number of proposals regarding the global antimicrobial use reduction targets in animals, um, which you know, goes against the US approach because we've always been focused on reducing the need to use antimicrobials in animals. And so we've been working across the US government to identify what sort of proposals could we commit to and really focusing on disease prevention. And next slide, with that, I will turn it back to Dr. Campitelli to highlight some of the resources that she mentioned throughout the presentation today. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so this last few slides, I just want to highlight a few of the resources available. This QR code will take you to Animal Care's Publications, Forms, and Guidance Documents webpage, and that contains the list of all of our animal care aids. And I'm happy to announce that there were three uh, animal care aids that we added to our collection that all focus on AMR and the principles of cleaning, disinfection, isolation, and quarantine. So the, uh, some of them are available now. They, the full complement should be available you know, maybe in the next few weeks. Please be patient. Again, like Shannon mentioned, we're going through website modernizations. We've got a lot of people coming up with uh, leave on the, over the holiday times. So uh, be patient, but those should be coming out shortly. The other images that you see, again, all this will be clickable links if you download the PDF when it's posted. So I'm not gonna go into each and every one, but these images you can see uh, demonstrated the US as well as the global AMR Awareness Weeks um, just came off the week of Thanksgiving. So we're hoping to continue that vein and that, uh, that focus on antibiotics tonight. The other uh, at the bottom of the slide is the AVMA as well as other uh, practitioner associations that do have those stewardship principles that you can explore and tailor to your own practice if you don't have a plan already. These are all great resources for you to pick and choose what you like best. Next slide. Lastly, some of the reports that Chelsea quoted, as well as the, the uh, research papers that I uh, quoted as, as well, they're all listed on these sites. So again, uh, feel free to explore at your leisure. Next slide. Lastly, I wanna point out again, the Attending Veterinarians website, again, have a lot of resources for you to learn more about your role and your responsibilities. And again, this is where the the recording of this presentation will be linked as well as the PDF posted uh, when it's available. Next slide. So I hope that what we've accomplished tonight is that you're able to define and identify what AMR is and how it, uh, how it happens, the risk factors that contribute to it. I hope you've found something that you can do about it, both at your licensed facilities that you're attending at as well as within your overall clinical practices. And I hope you've took away something about the ongoing efforts that are within the government as well as across the globe and the resources that you can turn to to find out more. Next slide. Again, these are references to the video and the other reports that I've mentioned. Next slide, please. And actually one more. I wanna thank first and foremost, Dr. Chelsea for coming on. She's been with me on this project since the start. Uh, with all those animal carries that I mentioned, she's been uh, equally putting her eyes and, and giving her feedback on it, as well as the animal care team. Uh, I also wanna thank the AVMA for helping us also with their feedback on these, uh, this presentation, as well as the AIDS and um, contributing to the effort across agencies, across organizations to help get this message out to help uh, empower you all to, to make the changes that are necessary. So thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Shively. And I believe we have a few time, a few minutes for questions. Yes, we do have a few minutes for questions and I'm gonna back it up just a couple of slides because we do have questions on where they will be able to find the information, the recording and um, the documentations afterward for the PDF. So I'm gonna leave this slide up as we read the first question. I am an Australian lab animal vet completing my PhD in AMR and research rodents. Is there any way I can find out whether any of the reported human MDR infections are associated in rodent 
enclosures. This is a compelling data point for the stewardship program I am instituting. I can jump in and say, uh, you know, I don't know specifically if any of those, uh, any of the resources that we provided would report uh, specifically about rodents, um, but I will direct you. So the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System, or NARMS, is a collaborative effort between uh, CDC looking at human infections, FDA looking at uh, our retail meats, and USDA with the food safety Food Safety Inspection Service uh, looking at slaughter facilities and tracking antimicrobial resistance. And this collaboration has gone uh, back to the 1990s. Um, so CDC has, uh, if you just Google CDC NARMS, uh, you'll be able to find the human information and they have a dashboard called NARMS Now with human data. And so feel free to explore that. They have a lot of information about antimicrobial resistance trends um, that they've been looking at in specific bacterial species over time. And then CDC also has additional information about what they call rep strains, or those are known as recurring, emerging, and persisting um, bacterial strains. And so that's where they put updates about um, things that might not necessarily be an outbreak, but a trend that they're watching over time. So if you're interested in the human health aspect, again, I would point you to CDC. That is going to be a US, uh, U.S. data source. So when thinking about this globally, uh, we don't have great uh, data aggregation across countries. Um, but if you're interested in the U.S. side, I would point you to CDC. Okay, and just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please enter it in the Q&A box and we will answer it. As we're waiting to see if any other questions come in, I just wanna thank everybody again. I thank you for your commitment to ensuring the welfare of the animals at those facilities. Looks like we might have some more questions coming in, so I'll stop there for now. Um, I'm not sure if we are offering CE credits, but one of the question is how do we get CE certificate, uh, a certificate for this course? Unfortunately, we do not have CE available for tonight's presentation, but we are glad you stuck through it. Thank you so much for listening and, and joining with us. The next comment says, thank you, data shows sharing of the micro between lab rodents and humans. I think that was maybe a follow-up to the original question because it's the same um, individual. Yeah, I would echo uh, Chelsea's recommendations to pursue those resources and explore the different uh, links that are being made as more and more patients and samples are being analyzed. This one says out of sheer curiosity how many people are attending the web, web presentation. And so the largest number that we saw today was 130. Thank you for asking. Thank you all for being here. Uh, next question is, is big pharma altering prescribing details for commonly used antimicrobials to support reducing resistance and or overusage? So I checked the FDA website, that GFI 263 that I mentioned, um, the FDA has on their website that they successfully issued this campaign to um, ask for voluntary participation in this prescription only, you know, language on all their and uh, over the counter antibiotics. So I don't know 100% what that means as far as suppliers. Um, but like I know that when I was uh, prescribing a veterinary diet for my cat, um, I'm, I'm not a common prescriber, by the way, but when I was doing that for my own cat, um, through, you know, Chewy, for example, I, I had to get confirmation that yes, I am a veterinarian, yes, I have a license, and yes, this is an appropriate prescription. So I imagine, but I'm not 100% sure that that's how it would work. 
Um, again, the FDA has put out messaging on their on their website that they have gotten complete compliance with this program. So again, that's uh, on the label, on the manufacturing product packaging, whatever that they're having those uh, language for prescription use only at a veterinarian's discretion, something to that effect. And I can just add to that. Uh, I work regularly with FDA and FDA recently published an updated uh, antimicrobial stewardship document that outlines their five-year plans. Um, so I would encourage you to check out their uh, latest report that covers 2024 through 2028. And I think one thing that is unique about the U.S. system is that FDA tries to work in a voluntary capacity with uh, the pharmaceutical companies, and they've been very successful in doing that. Uh, and it's had some um, really positive impacts of they've been able to implement these changes much faster than if they went through the regulatory process. Uh, and they've been able to get 100% compliance, like Kathy mentioned. Um, but I will say one of the things that they're looking at next, so this is a, an area for continuous improvement as we learn more, uh, but they're really looking at um, duration of use. And so this specifically is related to our food producing animals, but trying to make sure that products that currently do not have a defined duration of use on their label, um, supporting research to help these companies have a defined duration. So not just to be fed the entire feeding period, um, but really identifying where can they have the greatest impact uh, on the disease mechanisms in these animal populations while limiting uh, the overall duration that these products are being used. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more. It says culture and sensitivity are very expensive to run for small animal in clinic practices. Therefore, it's rarely feasible to run routinely. Do you have any suggestions to help us implement this tool? Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I understand. And like I said, you know, I wouldn't advocate for every single infection that walks through the door, maybe use those uh, recommendations in a, in a capacity where you're, you're choosing them intentionally. If you've got a, a whole run of, um, you know, bladder infections coming in lately, maybe send one just to see, you know, if you're still prescribing the right things. And especially in the cases of a treatment failure, like you tried one drug and it's not working anymore, or the, the patient's uh, symptoms hasn't resolved, that would probably be the time that I would certainly recommend to try that, um, you know, just because it's, it's not gonna be every single infection that walks through your door. I, I know that that's not realistic and, and practical to, to recommend. Um, so I don't expect that that's gonna be what you take away from tonight. Um, but just using some thought processes when you're considering, you know, instead of just reaching for the same old drugs that you've used, you know, for however many years, you know, just putting a little bit more thought behind it. That's all. Okay. And I'll just echo that. I think we see the same thing for our livestock animal species as well, that costs can be prohibitive to running the diagnostics, especially compared to the cost of treatment. Um, one tool that I might point you to, um, whatever lab that you're using, a lot of labs are starting to develop what they call antibiograms, which is just basically a report of the trends of resistance that they're seeing in their samples. And so that can be one way, if you're not able to do culture and sensitivity, at least get an idea of, you know, if you're seeing increased resistance to this specific drug for this uh, disease, you know, maybe that shouldn't be your first choice. Um, think of another antibiotic that might be uh, a little bit more successful. And then exactly what Kathy said, I will say, keep track of those treatment outcomes. And when you're seeing treatment failures, that's when you should definitely try to prioritize culture and sensitivity. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to say that there are a couple of comments that say nice presentations and thank you for the information. And so with that being said, I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. And I would also like to thank our presenters. You will receive a short, short survey following the webinar. So please take a few minutes to provide your feedback. We graciously appreciate it. And this concludes today's webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you.